Welcome everybody to tonight's webinar with Tony McClellan and Nick Cater. What I'd like to do is, of course, introduce myself. I will be the host, national webinar host. Uh, my name is Greg Bondar. I'm also the New South Wales and ACT State Director uh, for Family Voice Australia. I'm hoping everybody's registering. Please note that the webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all the participants at a later date in about a week once it's been edited. As with any uh, organisation, I'd like to get rid of some adver advertising because our next webinar will be on <clears throat> Monday, 25th of October. And we've got Bettina Arndt and Dr. Kevin Donnelly talking about oh. political correctness gone mad. And of course, um, if you know, Kevin Donnelly has written a wonderful book as well, Cancel Culture and the Left Long March. So that will be a wonderful interview as well. So we're looking forward to having them. So please register at familyvoice.org.au. Well, our guests tonight, of course, are Tony McClellan and Nick Cater. But what I'm going to do is before I go into a formal introduction, I'm just going to open up in prayer, if you don't mind, and that'll give everybody else a chance to register. So let's just open up in a quick prayer as we commit this webinar to our Lord. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for bringing us together here as brothers and sisters in Christ. We welcome the words and thoughts of both Tony and Nick as they share with us the book that they've written, A Glorious Ride. Heavenly Father, it's so important that we as Christians declare our faith and share our faith in the public arena. So be with us tonight and help us to get a message across to everyone that, salva that true salvation is through your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. All right. Thank you very much. Um, Nick, you'll notice we've got a modern photo there of you. Um, I did have a younger one, <laughs> but uh, we've got a modern photo of you there. Thank you. And um, yeah. it, it's important that we, we, we do that. Now, can, can I just say that Tony McClellan is an author and, it, and is chairman emeritus of the Australian Christian Lobby. Nick Cater, co-author, writer, media commentator on political and cultural affairs, now executive director of the Men's Reach Research Centre. And I must commend Nick and the, uh, and the centre for a wonderful launch that they did of Tony's book a few weeks ago. And that's available, I think, on your website, Tony, uh, Nick, if I... If yeah, I it is, yeah. Okay. Oh, it's on, oh, no, it's a, a link which we can, uh, Tony has. You know, a link, can perfect. Yeah. So please go to the Menzies Research Centre website as well. Okay, well, look, one of the things I want to do is um, just to mention that A Glorious Ride is a book that was written by Tony McLean. It's an autobiography, but with much input from Nick Cater as well. Can I also say that Wilkinson Publishing are the publishers and it's available at a number of bookshops, but in particular, it's available from Wilkinson Publishing. They're on the website. Please go there and have a look and you will be able to get a copy. Can I also mention that we will be giving away a copy of the book tonight, which I have, thank you, courtesy of um, uh, Tony and, and Wilkinson Publishing. And um, that book will be given away near the end and I'll get Tony McClellan to help me draw the lucky winner of that glorious soft cover book which we'll give away at a later date. All right well look let me introduce first Tony McClellan. Um, Tony um, started his career on a sheep station west of Dubbo mending fences and killing rabbits I'm told at a place called Jumble Plain. Now, if you have a look at the slide in front of you you can see that uh, it's way out right in the centre of uh, New South Wales and I believe Tullamore is the actual geographical centre of New South Wales, but more of that later. Now, Tony's business career has spanned the hotel industry, mining, software development, real estate, and of course, service to God. Your book is an inspiring story, Tony, of practical faith and a determination to live, give life a go. The book is, is very inspiring for all Christians, but more importantly, it really is about how you ended up serving God. Look, let's meet Tony McClellan and we'll pass over to him. 
Tony, just to start it off, and then we'll go to Nick as well later. Tony, just tell us about tell us where you were born and a bit about your family, if you can, Tony. Well, thank you very much, Greg, for having us. Uh, I was born uh, in Tullamore Hospital on April Fool's Day, 1940. And uh, my dad had a large sheep station out of town, famous property called Jumble Plains. And uh, there I was raised uh, until I went off to high school in Sydney and came back in sad circumstances when my dad was very ill and he subsequently died a few months later. Now, Tony, just uh, very quickly, look, I've got a map here. A lot of people wouldn't know where Jumble Plains was. Now, just tell us, it is, uh, well, it's around, nearest town is Dubbo, I gather, is it, Tony? Well, D Dubbo was one of the main um, shopping places and also parks. My yeah, family yeah. was more inclined to go to parks, but uh, Dubbo uh, parks, as you can see, are about equidistant from the Jumble Plains uh, homestead yeah. on the map there. And uh, uh, so got to know Dubbo pretty well. Had a dance orchestra in Dubbo later in my life. And uh, Parks has got a lot of fun, fond memories. In particular, my first pair of long pants <laughs> my dad bought for me in Parks. Oh, well, there you go. I mean, I actually have friends in Parks and in a little town called Baldry, Tony. Ah. Uh, which is just outside of Parks, but that's another story. Well, look, yes. Tony, what I'd like to do is, could you tell me a bit about um, where where you were born? Well, I was born at the Tullamore District Hospital, uh, which is a pretty simple place, but, uh, but uh, it was uh, the obvious place for my mother to have her three children and uh, had subsequently had a few minor operations there, tonsillitis and so on. But uh, thank God for places like that, the Bush nurses uh, do such a great job a long way from anywhere. Now, Tony, that's actually a picture of the Tullamore Hospital back I in the thought, 50s. I, I thought I recognised it, yeah. Yeah, so you would have been born in, in there somewhere, I suspect, Tony. So, yeah, um, yes. But more importantly, tell me about your schooling, because this is a picture of the school on the cover of your book. And I noticed, look, that looks like my backyard shed, Tony. <laughs> tell, <laughs> me, <laughs> tell me about um, your schooling. <laughs> on the adjacent uh, sheep station, uh, there was this little hut, and the men of the children in the district got together and had a couple of days or three days working bee and uh, pulled it together and uh, a school was started that I started in second grade. I began with my mother was school of the air, learning to read and write and then started riding my bike to this uh, little cottage which had uh, 11 pupils and a maximum of 11. <laughs> Nobody ever in my grade, one teacher. And, uh, and that's where I spent um, five years of my primary schooling. So you rode your bike to school, Tony? I... Yes, I did. I did. Wow. wow. How good is that? Well, look, let's have a look at the moment. I want to turn to Nick, if I could. Nick, I read in the book a very interesting uh, passage. And you say in the book... Difficult as some of us may find it to, su to surrender to faith, I share Tony's conviction that we must not shrink from the gospel's message or to try and soften the edges. Nick, what did you mean by that? And how did you come across it? That's a wonderful passage. Could you expand on that for me, please, Nick? Well, there, there's, um, there's a section in the book uh, about Tony's later life when he was in Atlanta, Georgia, and um, uh, became a member of an Episcopalian church as it was at that time. Uh, but they realized that the Episcopalian church in the US was going off the rails. It was, it, it was woke before woke was fashionable, I think. Um, and, 
uh, anyway, it's a, it's a fascinating story. It's a story of Tony's leadership and courage that he, along with the minister, helped uh, you know lead the church out of the Episcopalian church, and it be, became a, a church in its own right. You know, very much uh, uh, driven by uh, the imperative to follow the gospel, follow the words of Christ. And now, um, what of course has subsequently happened is that church has gone on. Uh, to be a massive success, and not just in Atlanta, but it has an international outreach in the Middle East, uh, massive membership, whereas the Episcopalian Church has just continued to shrink into nothingness. So I think when I read this, I thought, yeah, well, that's it, isn't it? You know, uh, you, 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 a church that, that tries away from the difficult bits mm. um, is is not in the end not going to attract people to it and in the back of my mind i don't know whether we refer to this in the book but i was thinking too about you know my day job which is the think tank um the men's research center is a think tank attached to the liberal party so of course i'm following all the time these debates about you know conviction politics and and whether we have enough conviction politics whether we need more of it um but I think it's true of a political party too, that a political party that strays, you know, tries to make it easier for people to join it, you know, adjusts its values, you know. Is it the old Groucho Marx one, isn't it? Here are my values. If you don't like these, I've got some other ones. <laughs> that, that, that doesn't work for a political party any more than it does for a church. So yeah. I, I did think about that. And also, I suppose, at a personal level, uh, if I can talk about that a bit, Greg, you know, I mean, I, mm. I, I suppose... I've been, I've been kind of, my faith has been strengthening again um, in, in, in the last five years or so, I suppose. And, and actually working with Tony on this book actually really did help me um, think a lot harder about what it means to be a, a true disciple and, and truly commit yourself to God and, and truly to embrace the mystery of faith. So the, all that was going on in my head too. So that, <laughs> that resulted in that one sentence, which is taking about... Uh, 50 sentences to explain. Uh, Tony, we'll come back to that. And uh, uh, Nick, we'll come back to that because that's an interesting uh, subject you raise. And if I can get back to Tony, because going on from what Nick said, Tony, can you tell me how and when you became a Christian? Um, I'll be delighted to, Greg, and the, the book uh, speaks of this at, mm. at uh, length. But uh, we, we'd lived a very frantic, busy life. In total, Ray and I, now married 60 years, have uh, lived in eight countries in 41 homes. A lot of pressure, a lot of racing around, a lot of travel. And finally, um, Ray got stressed with uh, all this and said, no, I've had enough. I want to move back to Australia. And I thought it was a joke. And uh, she didn't have the courage to do that. And I went off for the weekend playing tennis. Mm. Went down to Florida to play in a tournament down there and came back and she was gone. I couldn't believe it. So uh, I was absolutely broken and uh, was uh, in tears and uh, couldn't believe that this part of my life had now disappeared. And it so happened that this uh, famous church of which Nick speaks, uh, they, we'd just been the week before uh, for the first time to this new church. And the minister doing what all good ministers should do, uh, planned to come around and visit us. And he arrived and found Ray gone and uh, said, what's happened? And uh, I told her that told him that uh, Ray had left to go back to Sydney, and uh, he said, "You need Jesus." And I said, "No, I need help." I didn't know at then that Jesus was the one to help. Anyway, we uh, encouraged me to sit on the couch with him uh, and pray and uh, sought forgiveness. And instantly, I realized that all of this pain had been caused by me. Asked for forgiveness and, uh, and began 
at that instant the healing process. It took a couple of weeks and finally Ray had the courage to allow me to come down to Sydney to see her. We were in Atlanta, Georgia at that time. And I flew to Sydney and were, in the meantime, I had some uh, uh, counseling from a very fine Christian man who uh, helped me a lot. And I uh, got down to Ray, Ray uh, accepted me, took me in for who I, uh, I was, and uh, we began slowly our new life together. Wonderful. Well, well that brings a question then, Tony. I've met your wife and I've got to tell you, she's a wonderful lady. I'm not being gratuitous, but she's a wonderful lady. And uh, my wife also says how wonderful it is to talk to Ray. Tony, how did you meet Ray? Well, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, uh, I, I was having uh, uh, breakfast at the Tottenham Hotel and, <laughs> and, uh, and a, a very <laughs> lonely place. And seated at what I thought was my table was a very nice looking blonde, uh, 19 years old. And I wondered who on earth could this be? Where did she come from? And I found out that she was, in fact, a new school teacher just moved into town. So I met her over breakfast. We uh, happened to meet over lunch and then over dinner. And um, I used to have dance orchestras in those days. And I was playing the piano upstairs. She came by. We had a chat, and uh, and uh, she became uh, interested in learning a little bit more about me. And we began a a, a courtship. I described a couple of nights ago. I took to her because. She had the best legs in town. And uh, <laughs> I don't know whether that's really the case, but uh, after uh, a year, we became engaged. After about 18 months, we married at age 20. And my uh, whole life has revolved around this beautiful woman. And I'm very proud to say as you'd mentioned, Greg, we've just celebrated our 20th or nine months ago, celebrated our 20th, our uh, 60th wedding yeah. anniversary. Yeah. So uh, time moves on, but uh, we're in, uh, really strong now, I believe. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. That brings me then, Nick, um, I read in your introduction, you actually visited Tottenham Hotel. Oh, I did. I, 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 no, I was so, I was so <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. We, uh, we even had a beer in the front bar with, um, with, uh, our mutual friend, Richard Clegg, who actually lives a few doors down from the Tottenham hotel. But I, I did, I, yeah, I was just intrigued by that. I, I know that, um, Tony tells the story very well, but the, the bottom line is he met his wife in a pub and, uh, and he, <laughs> Uh, uh, but in, under the nicest circumstances, and, and of course, as, as is the way with a lot of these country hotels, it's very much as it was. I imagine the breakfast room is still there. So that that was absolutely fascinating. And then um, we also went out to Jumble Plains, Tony's where he grew up, and and uh, and you know the house where he grew up is still there. It's 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 uh, crumbling. It's it's suffered a bit of flood damage, but we were able to walk through and with 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 the um, the, the owners there, Greg and Sue Baker, who showed us mm. around, and um, you just got an idea of how tough it was, you know, back mm. back then in in the forties and fifties. When Tony was running that property at the age of sixteen, I just go, I take my hat off to him, like you know, mm. most sixteen year olds these days, you know, can't get out of bed before ten o'clock. But it, it, to, Tony's generation were very different, yeah. and I think we're very fortunate to have have the example of of. Tony's generation, and indeed the generation before, who had to go through world wars and 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 things weren't easy, and they did it tough. And um, I, I think his book should be uh, a, a great book to give to a young person mm. because you know mm. they can learn from that. And there's a one fa fabulous chapter at the end um, about you know basically Tony's advice, the things he wished he had have known when he was a young person. Um, yeah. So it's it's yeah. a great book.
Yeah. Mm. Now, now, Nick, you mentioned Richard Clegg, and I think uh, he's a friend of yours too, Tony. Now, I'm yeah. going to see if I can find Richard and and see if um, he could say a few words. Are you there, Richard? Oh, sorry. Um, where are we? Uh, there we go. Richard, are you there? Maybe he's not. Uh, he said he was going to come on board, but maybe he's not there. But Richard was going to come and join us and just say a few words. And oh. um, <clears throat> it's, um, it's uh, unfortunate that he's um, not able to join us. But there he is. Richard, can you say a few words? Hello, Richard. One, two, three. Richard, can you unmute yourself? Oh, well, we'll come back to Richard at this stage, but um, as soon as he's able to talk. Now, in the meantime, in that hotel, Tony, I think you, someone said you drove up in a sports car. What kind of car did you drive? Well, I had, uh, <laughs> had an Austin Healey 106, oh. <laughs> uh, which was a pretty squish car in those days. And, uh, well, I, I came by that because uh, my father had promised me that if I didn't drink, and he and my mother were both alcoholics, but if I didn't drink at all or smoke till I was 21, it would give me a thousand pounds. And uh, my, when he died at age 16, uh, my mother picked up that promise and uh, went through with it uh, and uh, adjusted the target to age 20 instead of age 19, uh, instead of 21. So at 20, I uh, received this money and was able to buy this sports car. And I was pretty, uh, pretty flashy around Tottenham, I can tell you that. Yeah, I, I can see you driving up to the hotel in the sports car, Tony, and uh, impressing uh, young Ray, 19-year-old school teacher. So um, well done to that. Now, I want to come back to, you, you mentioned earlier, Tony, if I could, I just want to jump back. The Vine story in your book, that, I find that fascinating. Can you just sort of add a bit more to that for me? The, the, what, the what story again? The Vine. The, the, the what? Vine? Ah, the Mine. Vine. 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 Sorry, I beg your pardon. Uh, one of the secrets to my um, salvation and change of heart was um, being broke and uh, losing everything. And uh, we went on a retreat, or invited on a retreat by Walk Through the Bible. And the founder spent a long weekend talking to us about uh, the vine from John 15. And the essence of the vine is that uh, uh, dw dwelling in Jesus with God as the vine dresser who comes along and those branches that are not bearing fruit, he cuts off and throws into the fire. And those that are dwelling in Jesus, who believe in him, are committed to him, he prunes so that they'll bear more fruit. And what we uh, were afraid of is that we were in sin some way and that he was pruning us to punish us. But we spent some time, serious time, conversing every known and unknown sin to be, make sure that we were clean. And uh, he then began the process of healing us and blessing us. Uh, it's the most um, key to my, both Ray's and my turnaround. And indeed at our 50th wedding anniversary, we had, we asked and uh, Simon Manchester, our minister, uh, preached from John 15, and opened it up from another perspective, which we really appreciated. Mm. So we we think about that all the time, and uh, 
are so grateful that God cut us back, which was really painful at the time, but has enabled us to flourish. And he's blessed us in ways that you cannot even begin to dream about. Mm. Wonderful, wonderful, Tony. I'm going to come back to that in a minute, but I just want to move back to Nick for a moment because, Nick, once again, I've taken a quote out of the book and it says, not everyone who reads this story will share Tony's faith and some may find his Christian interpretation of the world challenging. In what way, Nick? Well, I mean, I, let's say, I mean, first of all, when Tony showed me the, the manuscript, it was fantastic and great stories and, and a great... Uh, narrative too, you know, the way that it, halfway through his life he has this real, uh, well, I guess midlife crisis, you'd call it, uh, and then that's when, that's what draws him to to Jesus, and from then on he lives his life in a different way. So it's a lovely, you know, just the narrative structure is great. Um, but I, 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 I did feel that, you know, I mean, we could have just made it a really intensely um religious book if you like um and it would have had a good market because you know people of faith uh, are great readers uh but um i felt that it deserved a wider audience so i was i was kind of really keen that it didn't it didn't come cro as cross as the sort of you know life story story of a god botherer you know i wanted it to have uh and when i first looked at it i thought well you know it's rather too many verses from the Bible in there I'll, as I work, go through I'll, I'll snip a few of those out but do you know what I ended up putting some in because <laughs> <laughs> that was part of the story so I, I hope we've succeeded I mean I just and that's why I wrote that in the introduction I, I don't want people to be put off by the fact that it's you know some some people might be put off by that and I don't want them to be because the story has a terrific message in it anyway about how to live your life and how to be a, a courageous person, how to be a, a good leader, how to be a persistent person. Um, and, um, you know, if, if people can read it on that level, I think, and get a lot out of it, and um, and perhaps even, you know, it might um, bring them a little bit closer to, to faith. So that that's the challenge. I don't know whether we succeeded, but that's how I wanted to go about writing it. Ah. Now, Nick, you mentioned earlier, and I want to come back to this because I find God works in mysterious ways, really, and I know it's a phrase people use, but um, you said that as a result of co-authoring this work, your faith was challenged or renewed. Yeah. Or, is that, is that it, you know, that's fascinating, Nick, if that is the uh, situation. Hmm. Yeah, I, I look, I think particularly over 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 the idea of works. I was puzzling over this, you know, by their works, you should know them. What, what sort of works? You know, I work very hard, you know, and I'm, I generally, I think, work for good causes. Uh, it, it, what does that mean? And, and I had to work this through as I, you know, sort of helped Tony work through the narrative um, and until it, it really clicked. And that, and that is that, um, so Tony's life is two halves, right? It's the bit before he, uh, bef before he finds faith and the bit afterwards. Well, the bit before he's a he's a brilliant, exceptionally good businessman, and entrepreneur, and making a lot of money and you know very successful. Mm. Um, the second half of the book, he's also a brilliant businessman, but he's spending a bit more time with ph philanthropy. But what's the difference? And I, I I kind of and Tony hasn't argued with me, so I guess I must have got it right. <laughs> that the the difference before and afterwards is before he's working for himself and his family and you know the closer afterwards he's working for others you know broadly um and and that's what that's that's what you know the gospel that's what jesus asked us to do to commit our lives to helping others and in in practical ways and and so the the i the way i thought it was this well you know when tony made it made a few yeah, you know, a few million. He could have gone out and bought a, a nice yacht and cruised the harbour, and that would have surely brought a lot of pleasure to him and his wife and family and maybe a few lucky friends every now and then to get it come out the yacht with him. That was one way of spending a few million dollars. A another way would have been to you know to commit that to 
help other people, you know, mm. as Tony has done in, through the ACL or the mm. Lock Macquarie Institute. Mm. And then you think about the net amount of good and happiness that it brings to the human race. Obviously, if you commit it to other people, it's going to be a lot more, uh, you know, benefit to, to people than if you just keep it to you and your pals. So mm. that, that's what I began to think of it. And it, it's kind of inspired me to to think about my own life and, and, you know, how I can sort of the back end of my life, I suppose, as we all are, start thinking more about how I can help other people and not just necessarily with money. I mean, just in terms of spending your time with young people, mentoring young people, thinking about the next generation or, you know, getting involved with, 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 uh, you know, your church or getting involved with things like, um, you know, helping Mm. you know the homeless or whatever it is doesn't matter but just just start thinking about something other than yourself mm. thank you nick now tony you will recall uh you were chairman of acl and i think we do have martin Oz and i think jim wallace is also registered tonight so welcome to you gentlemen as well tony when we first met you will recall i think about 12 years ago you were chairman of acl and um I was hosting a Warren Trust luncheon uh, when he was Deputy Prime Minister and um, you and I sat next to each other. Right. And uh, the friendship uh, blossomed from there on. Tony, can you tell me about your time at ACL and the challenges you faced in, as, as, as an advocate for uh, family, freedom, faith, for, for, and advocating for, for, for you know, the, the mums and dads who are really Christians and just want a normal um, lifestyle, but tell us a bit about your experience with the the bombing that occurred, as you can see the photos up there now, Tony. Well, thank you, Greg. Um, uh, just looking at this picture here now uh, brings back uh, great pain and sadness. Getting a call at six o'clock in the morning, uh, I think it might have been five o'clock, saying our office had been bombed and uh, jumping in the car, we were living in Barrow all the time, raced down to our drive to Canberra and uh, finding this uh, mess. And there's the van there in which had been loaded with gas cylinders that were set off to uh, certainly damage, if not destroy the premises. And this was in the middle of the very vicious campaign that we were facing uh, by people who are in favor of same-sex marriage. And we were taking the role of defending traditional marriage. And um, the police at the time were quite skeptical of the idea that this might have been a same-sex marriage advocate behind this but sometime later, uh, he was uh, brought to trial and then subsequently committed suicide. And we learned that this sad individual had been involved in these movements overseas for some time. So we had to pick up our uh, uh, souls by our bootstraps, uh, reconstruct, uh, obviously, uh, the staff was very perturbed. Lyle Shelton was the managing director of the time. He's incredibly brave and courageous in dealing with this. Mm. But it was a dramatic moment in the life of ACL. And, uh, and uh, we re-jigged re the premises. I provided a whole lot of additional lighting and security. And I haven't had any more problems since then. But uh, later, of course, we got uh, the plebiscite was held and uh, people voted in favor of it. And so there's not the same uh, viciousness felt about ACL, I don't think, uh, nowadays. No, uh, it's very difficult because <clears throat> I think the media weren't too, too um, friendly to ACL at the time. But uh, interesting that you were chairman and you were on the ABC program as well. And I saw that video where you were defending the faith in the public yeah. arena. Um, Tony, just to move on, the Men's Research Centre, which you're on, on the board of as well. Um, 
tell me, all the directorships you've held, all the businesses you've been in, um, all the travels you've done, Tony, can you tell us what in your in your span of um, corporate life, what was the most um, outstanding corporate achievement you think you did, um, which, which of course is covered in a book, but I want you if you could share that with us now. Well, thank you. I'm, uh, uh, I've been, and I believe it's all to do with, uh, with our recommitment uh, following our salvation, our understanding of, uh, of the vine and our appreciation of a new direction in our lives. Uh, I've said to many people that just after we were saved, uh, I had uh, lunch with the man who, who developed the concept of half time, uh, wrote a book, very wealthy, very successful businessman from Dallas. And uh, basically he said, when you get to a certain point in your life, you must pause uh, and take stock and think about what you're really doing and who you're working in favor of. And it really struck us, both Ray and me, um, only a couple of weeks ago, I got that book out, which I believe was given to me at the time and found it so heavily marked up and noted. And uh, Ray and I became convicted. We bought copies for every member of our family. And we decided to, uh, as Nick had sort of indicated, uh, we, we decided that we would concentrate more on serving others. And uh, I believe God has honored that in a magnificent way. Uh, when we were broke, uh, a man uh, came to look at my software that I was developing, then really struggled to raise the capital, and asked me the following morning whether uh, I'd be satisfied with 10 million. <laughs> 10 million was just such an incredible amount of money. He later invested a further 15 million in the company and we were able to build a company, uh, hired 50, built it up to 50 people, took it public and so on. And we he headed back to Australia and I wasn't long back in Australia when I was approached by the CSIRO who's, who said, I've got this invention that uh, I'd like to get your, on which we'd like to get your opinion. And uh, it was about uh, the mining industry. I'd had a lot of experience there. Was the first president of Barrick Gold uh, and done a lot. See, even after we came back from overseas. And I told at CSIRO, I thought it was brilliant. They had been working on it for 15 years. And they came back to me a few months later and said, well, give us a proposal to commercialize it. And I was really taken with it, worked really hard, completely speculatively, raised the seed capital, 15 million we raised, and then uh, launched this product. And uh, four years later, the, we just raised uh, for this company uh, another 50 million but this time at 22 and a half times what the original capital went in at. So it's been an unbelievable success. And from our point of view, uh, we know that God has blessed that because uh, he knows what we're doing with the money, giving it to our foundation so we can give it away. Wonderful, 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 Tony. Uh, now, look, let me just go back quickly to your cricketing days out in the bush. Now, I don't know if you even managed to get a team going out there, Tony, because you need 11 players, of course. So tell me a bit about the cricket. Uh, what, 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 what's, what are some of the memories? Who did you play against? Well, we, we had, in those days, cricket, in the, cricket and tennis and ballroom dancing were <laughs> huge social events in the bush and we have uh, little cricket grounds all, all over the country and we went from one to another and I became captain of the local team to call the Top Woodlands Colts 
and uh, we had some success. I was uh, captain of it. Later, I was appointed captain of the Far West Eleven, and uh, and uh, had some only moderate success, I'd have to say, but uh, thoroughly enjoyed it. Joined the fellowship, and got to know some wonderful people, including Richard Clegg, who we'd just spoken about. He was a bowler. I was a wicket keeper and, uh, and, an, and an opponent, but uh, we got to know one another and have kept in touch all that time, which is obviously more than 60 years because uh, Ray and I were just courting in those days when I was uh, active in that. So I liked it a lot uh, and uh, it was such a, a great social thing in the bush, as was tennis. And I became uh, uh, chairman of the local tennis club. And then when we settled in Warren, our first matrimonial home, I was elected chairman there and uh, really loved the great camaraderie amongst both the men and the women and uh, enjoy that a lot. What's, uh, what, I don't know what might be happening now, Greg, but just to fill in the blank, I, I must tell you a story. When, uh, yeah, when we were married, the, way, the, the best way of communication was by telegram. And uh, you might remember that telegrams uh, 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 didn't use periods. It was all done with Morse code. And so they used the word stop to end the sentence. And uh, the, the standard drill was for the best man to read the telegrams out at the, uh, at the dinner or the, the evening after you're married, we're having a celebratory dinner. And so he stood up and wrote, read all these telegrams that came piling in. And I'll never forget, and we've <laughs> quoted it in the book, we got a uh, telegram, could be from Richard Craig, but somebody from the local Top Woodlands Colts team. And, uh, and uh, it said, uh, congratulations, stop. Top Woodlands Colts, bowls another maiden over. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Greg, I think you're on mute. Thank you very much. What a wonderful story, Tony. <laughs> I think that's most appropriate. Now, look, Tony, just on that, I want to just quickly move to um, to your to your business ventures again. Just out of interest, look, uh, there are a lot of Christian youth out there that are aspiring to be uh, CEOs global, globally recognised for their talents. Tony, having been there... Um, it's very difficult for the youth of today, Christian youth in particular, to be putting uh, God before career. Yes. And I know there's a chapter in your book, but what advice do you have for young Christian men and women who are wanting to put their careers before God? Well, I, I'm afraid to, uh, to uh, suggest this, but they may well end up like I did. Uh, that is a broken marriage and a ruined career. And uh, I, am, I would never counsel them to do that. And then, as Nick referred to it, the, the final chapter, I list down some of the piece of pieces of advice that I've accumulated over the years and doing all sorts of things like being persistent and so on. Uh, but the best and most important piece of advice is to seek God's face, to look for God everywhere. And uh, that was what led me to recovery. Thank you, Tony. Nick, very quickly, because I want to go back to the Men's Research Centre. 
as you know, Scott Morrison, Christian, believes in miracles. We've now got uh, Dominic Perrette, another lawyer, businessman, wonderful Christian man as well. Nick, from your point of view, having spoken to these corporate leaders, how difficult it is, even for organisations like ourselves, Family Voice and uh, ACL and what have you, but the Mentors Research Centre, how difficult it is to advocate in the public square on matters of faith, Nick? Uh, well, it, it shouldn't be hard, but it is. Um, uh, yeah, and I think that's because in the last 40 years, I suppose, we've had this growing really radical anti, anti-faith anti movement, really, on the left left of politics, almost exclusively on the left of politics, um, really sort of radically secularist. And they misunderstand what Australia is as a secular society. But, um, you know, I want to throw out some what I think is some good news, really, and that is I think there's an increasing awareness of the importance of faith. We've been, Men's Research Centre, we've been doing a lot more um, on, you know, the, the, the role of faith in civic society. We've produced a book called God of Menzies, which explains mm. Robert Menzies' Christian faith and, and how those principles came to influences thinking about the Liberal Party. and So you see this direct continuation between the Judeo-Christian tradition and the way this country is today. Uh, obviously, I've been involved in, in Tony's book. We, we've done a lot with Greg Sheridan and his great mm. book, you know, The Urgent Case for Jesus. Yep. We're, we're doing another podcast with him this week. Uh, and I, I've done this sort of thinking, oh, somebody's, I'm going to get some kickback. Somebody's going to say, look, you're not the ACL, you're the Mendes Research Centre, but nobody has yet and, and in fact quite the opposite like a lot of people have, have been really attracted to these things we've done on matters of faith and matters of values and and i reckon i think that's greg is that that's because for a lot of people they just feel that there's not enough values in politics and and a debate about christian values and how they apply is um is long overdue the interesting thing you mentioned scott morrison you mentioned dominic perrottet i mean does anybody can anybody think of a prime minister we've had in this country since federation well before of course who hasn't you know been at least in some way nominated mm. themselves mm. as a christian mm. oh, there's one right julia gillard who who said at the outset she was an atheist and i think that's great credit to her. She was she she had she you know she was up front about that. We knew where she stood. She didn't mess around. But you know every you know John Howard you know a, 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 you know, a great man of faith. Um, obviously Scott Morrison, Tony Abbott, you know Malcolm Turnbull was a Catholic. Uh, you know even even Bob Hawke and. and Keating in their own ways, they probably weren't great churchgoers. Mm. So I, I think, you know, the normal people are in a very different space to these noisy voices you hear on the ABC or, you know, the people who go on Q&A and attack Lyle Shelton when he's brave enough to go on on Martin Isles. Uh, good on them because they know that they go on that show and they may get a lot of flack from the other panellists and, and the ABC audience, but they know that they're talking out there to people who understand this and share their values. Absolutely, Nick. And um, let me assure you, keep up the good work because your reward will be in heaven, Nick, if not here, mate. Okay? <laughs> Tony, Thanks, back mate. to you. There's the corporation you kicked off with, which are very impressive, and uh, uh, that's something you spoke about. But, Tony, I want to move to, if I could, to this. Now, you have flown on the Concorde, I think, uh, oh, I don't know, 11, 12 times across the Atlantic. Now, I have to warn you, Tony, I'm learning to be a pilot at the moment. Oh. I've, done, I've had three lessons so far, so I'm not quite ready for the Concorde. But, Tony, tell us the, t just tell us and share with us very quickly. Uh, it's very easy to get caught up in the corporate world of, of fun and 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 the trappings of, of success did you find that challenging in at that time because i'm not i'm not sure in the time sequencing whether you're a christian or not in those days but did you find that, that there was any any challenge between your faith and and the trappings of corporate life 
uh, the the answer is when I was flying the Concorde, I wasn't a Christian, and uh, the reason for doing it, and I, I, Nick went through my records I have of uh, all my international flights, hundreds and hundreds of them <laughs> over the years. I was, one year I was 35% of my nights in a foreign country. We're trying to get Barrett Gold off the ground, uh, finding the money and finding the exploration opportunities, hiring people, setting up exploration offices, and so on. And I used to, uh, Nick tracked it down, but I was on the Concorde 15 times in one year, uh, going between uh, America and Europe, principally Paris or London, uh, where the two uh, destinations were, and back and forth, back and forth. And uh, uh, I, so I didn't, uh, didn't think of it in, in godly terms then, but mm. it's an absolutely amazing experience when I think back on it. I didn't, uh, it didn't occur to me at the time. It's just another way, uh, the quicker way to get to Europe. You do three and a quarter hours and uh, you're, li in, you're left, left New York and you're in London, uh, <laughs> uh, as opposed to flying all night uh, the other way. And so it was an incredibly yeah. convenient. Yeah. Well, Tony, I have to tell you, um, I've offered a few of my friends the opportunity to fly with me, but no one's taken me up. Um, nobody <laughs> wants to share my uh, flying experience of three hours to date. But anyway, that's another story. Look, what I'd like to do here is, uh, Tony and Nick, in in a few in a few um, words, uh, the book I've read in detail, and I have to tell you that. Uh, that the book itself is a wonderful read and I'm highly recommended, not because I'm talking to you, uh, to both of you, but it, it really had brought tears to my eyes in a few occasions because I personally love the Outback and I was just sharing the achievements you've made that uh, many would never even dream of being able to make. Tony, you first and then, oh, Nick first and then Tony. Nick, in one sentence, what do you think the book will achieve? What do you hope it will achieve in the public arena? Uh, I, I hope it will show people that uh, success in life uh, is not accidental, that it, it comes through commitment, hard work and persistence, and that whatever we think of as success, you know, perhaps when we're younger, we think of it differently. You know, real success in life is is to is to is to follow God to, uh, and to follow God's word and to you know live your life as faithfully as you can as uh, according to the, the gospels mm, thank you Nick. and Tony what are you praying for that this book will achieve in the public arena with colleagues and friends uh, out there just share with us please Tony well Nick is so articulate and it said it so well but the the message of the book, the theme of it, was developed uh, out at the cemetery when they uh, 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 lowered my father's uh, uh, mm. coffin into the grave. Mm. And uh, it, it is from, from Alfred Lord Tennyson, to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And I think there's so much in that for young people to strive, to seek, to find, and not to yield. And so it's so much driven uh, uh, me and uh, the, my approaches to issues. And, uh, and I, I, I expect it's been a big factor in these uh, extraordinary successes that I've had. Tony, I have to tell you, thank you very much for the opportunity to read your book. Look, I highly recommend it for anybody. Give it as a gift with Christmas. And I'm so pleased to have you and both Nick on Freedom Day uh, ah. at my webinar. <laughs> 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 and uh, I'll remember it for what it's worth, Freedom Day. Tony, being a man of faith, I wonder if you could close in prayer and then we'll end the night because uh, I promised you one hour and that's what we're at. Tony, I'd love for you to close in prayer for us. 
Thank you very, very much, uh, Greg. Dear God, uh, we come to you at the end of a day that's been just extraordinary. We thank you for Greg and his faith and his commitment and his earnestness. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity to explain some of the background in this story. I thank you for my dad. I ask you to uh, protect and bless him in heaven. I thank you for my mother. And I thank you especially for my darling wife, Ray, who's been everything to me. And so, Father, send us out to do the work you've given us to do, to love you and serve you as faithful witnesses of Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Tony. Thank you, Nick. Um, I know we're due to have another lunch. I think it might be Nick's shout, not mine. <laughs> <laughs> So, look, on behalf My of... My pleasure. Uh, thank you, Nick. On behalf of Family thank Voice, you, the governing committee, the members, the supporters, and all the people that joined us tonight, thank you very much. The book is available through Wilkinson Publishing. Please go to the website, and I wish you well, and God bless you for tonight. Goodbye, everybody.